Huck Everlasting, Chapter 25. The first week of August was long over, and now, though autumn was still some weeks away, there was a feeling that the year had begun its downward arc, that the wheel was turning again slowly now, but soon to go faster, turning once more in its changeless sweep of change. Winnie, standing at the fence in front of the Touch Me Not Cottage, could hear the new note in the voices of the birds. Whole clouds of them lifted, chattering, into the sky above the wood, and then settled, only to lift again. Across the road, goldenrod was coming into bloom, and an early drying milkweed had opened its rough pod, exposing a host of downy-headed seeds. As she watched, one of these detached itself into a sudden breeze and sailed suddenly off, while others leaned from the pod as if to observe its departure. When he dropped down cross-legged on the grass, two weeks had gone by since the night of the storm, the night of May Tuck's escape, and May had not been found. There was no trace of her at all, or of Tuck or Miles or Jessie. Winnie was profoundly grateful for that, but she was also profoundly tired. It had been a trying two weeks. For the hundredth time, she reviewed it all, how the constable had come into the cell soon after she had settled herself on the cot, how he had let down a shutter over the window to keep out the rain, how then he had stood over her as she hunched under the blanket, her breath heavy, trying to look as large as possible, how finally she had he had gone away and not come back till morning. But she had not dared to sleep, for fear she would kick off the blanket and give herself away, give the tucks away unwittingly. So she had lain there, pulse thudding, eyes wide open. She would never forget the rattle of the rain on the jailhouse roof, or the smell of the wet wood, or the darkness that had saved them all, or how difficult it was not to cough. She had wanted to cough as soon as it occurred to her that she mustn't, and she passed a long hour trying to swallow every tickle that perversely constricted her throat. And she would never forget the crash outside that made her heart race, that she could not investigate, and did not understand till morning. When on the way home, she saw that the gallows had blown over in the wind. But oh, it made her tremble still to remember the constable's face when he found her. She had heard first a bustling in the front of the jail and smelled fresh coffee and had sat up stiff with apprehension. Then the inner door opened, the door she now saw, which separated the office from the pair of cells, and in the light that streamed before him, the constable appeared, carrying a breakfast tray. He was whistling cheerfully came up to the barred door of her cell and looked in, and his whistle died on his lips as if it had run down and needed to be wound up again. But this comical astonishment lasted for a moment only, and then his face fl flushed red with anger. Winnie had sat on the cot, eyes downcast, feeling very small and very like a criminal. In fact, she was soon shouting, he was soon shouting that if she were older, he would have to keep her there that it was a crime, what she had done. She was an accomplice. She had helped a murderer escape. She was in fact a criminal, but too young to be punished by the law. Worse luck, he told her, for she badly needed punishing. She was released then into the custody of her mother and father, and these new words, accomplice and custody, chilled her blood. Over and over they asked her, shocked at first and then wistful, why had she done such a thing? Why? She was their daughter. They trusted her. They had tried to bring her up properly with a true sense of right and wrong. They did not understand. And finally, she had sobbed the only truth there was into her mother's shoulder, the only explanation. The tucks were her friends. She had done it because in spite of everything, she loved them. This of all things her family understood and afterwards they drew together staunchly around her. It was hard for them in the village when he knew it was, and the knowledge gave her pain, for they were proud, and she had shamed them. Still, this side of the affair was not without its benefits, at least for Winnie. Though she was confined to the yard indefinitely and could go nowhere, not even with her mother or grandmother, the other children wandered by her, wandered by to look at her, to talk to her through the fence. They were impressed by what she had done. 
she was a figure of romance to them now, where before she had been too neat, too prissy, almost somehow too clean to be a real friend. Winnie sighed and plucked at the grass around her ankles. School would open soon. It wouldn't be so bad. In fact, she thought as her spirits lifted, this year might be rather nice. And then two things happened. First of all, the toad appeared out of the weeds on her side of the road this time. It bounced out of a cover of old dandelion leaves and landed plop just beyond the fence. If she had reached her hand through the bar, she could have touched it. And next, a large brown dog with easy gait and dangling tongue came lopping down the road toward them. He stopped opposite the fence and looked at Winnie with a friendly swish of his tail, and then he saw the toad. At once, he began to bark, his eyes bright. He pranced up, his hind quarters leaping independently from side to side, nose close to the toad, his voice shrill with enthusiasm. Don't, cried Winnie, leaping to her feet and flapping her arms. Go away, dog, stop that, go, shoo. The dog paused. He looked up at Winnie's frantic dancing, and then he looked at the toad, who had pressed down close to the dirt, eyes tight shut. It was too much for him. He began to bark again and reached out a long paw. Oh, cried Winnie, oh, don't do that. Leave my toad alone. And before she had time to realize what she was doing, she bent, reaching through the bars and snatched the toad up and away from harm, dropping it onto the grass inside the fence. A feeling of revulsion swept through her. While the dog whined, pawing uselessly at the fence, she stood rigid, staring at the toad, wiping her hand again and again on the skirt of her dress. Then she remembered the actual feel of the toad and the revulsion paw passed. She knelt and touched the skin of its back it was rough and soft both at once and cool. When he stood up and looked at the dog, he was waiting outside the fence, his head on one side, peering at her longingly. It's my toad, when he told him, so you'd better leave it alone. And then on an impulse, she turned and ran into the cottage, up to her room, to the bureau drawer where she had hidden Jessie's bottle, the bottle of water from the spring. In a moment, she was back again, the toad still squatted where she had dropped it. The dog still waited at the fence. When he pulled out the cork from the mouth of the bottle and kneeling, she poured the precious water very slowly and carefully over the toad. The dog watched this operation and then yawning, he was suddenly bored. He turned and lopped away back down the road to the village. When he picked up the toad and held it for a long time without the least disgust, in the palm of her hand. It sat calmly blinking and the water glistened on its back. The little bottle was empty now. It lay on the grass at Winnie's feet. But if all of it was true, there was no, there was more water in the wood. There was plenty more, just in case. When she was 17, if she should decide, there was more water in the wood, Winnie smiled. Then she stepped and put her hand through the fence and set the toad free. There, she said, you're safe forever.